Welcome back, everybody, to the Prepared Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Austin, and got another episode for you all this week, getting into some of, probably some of the most common questions and, and things that I, I receive either via email, direct message, on, on social media, uh, friends ask me, they come up in conversation, all kinds of stuff. So uh, doing, uh, you know, talking about what your first step should be. Uh, you know, what do you buy first? What should you do first? What should you seek out first? Like, how do you kind of uh, roadmap, if you will? We, that's, you know, the term that we use uh, in the professional world. Typically, I mean, I work in finance, but uh, roadmap, right? So you can get a better idea of what is going to happen, what you need to plan for, what you need to budget for, most importantly, um, and what you need to look out for. Now, with as with all roadmaps that that can change it, it likely will change there will be delays there will be uh hang-ups and things like that we'll get into all of it we'll get real in the weeds uh did have a couple people reach out and ask for something like this um i, I believe uh around specifically like oh getting your first rifle right because there's so many things uh buying your first pieces of gear pieces of kit we're going to get into all of it. I think you guys are really going to enjoy this and maybe learn some things if you are in that position where you're still trying to put together, you know, what you consider to be a a good setup of kit. Uh, but before I jump into all of that, I do need to say thank you to our presenting sponsors here. Really really blessed to work with some really cool companies that bring a lot of great products to market that are uh, partnering and supporting us here. So got to say thank you to Midwest Gunworks. Guys, head on over to MidwestGunworks.com. Discount code prepared mindset is going to save you 5% off whatever you order. They've been in business since 97. This isn't some fly by night operation. You guys know, you know, they're going to have what you need. If they say they're going to send it, they're going to send it. If it's in stock, it's in stock, right? So whether you're just picking up some parts to finish a build, looking to buy something off the shelf, maybe you don't have the tools to, uh, to build your first rifle. That's fine. No shame in that at all. Head on over to Midwest Gunworks, pick up an AR-15, pick up a, a bolt action rifle. If you're getting into some of that long distance game, pick up a handgun, grab a Glock, whatever it could be a SIG, whatever you need. Again, discount code prepared mindset will save 5% off that order total. They also have things like magazines, lights, optics, and now stocking and selling Edgar Sherman design slings as a huge part of buying a rifle. Head on over to MidwestGunworks.com. Again, prepared mindset saves you 5% and supports the prepared mindset. Also, thank you to 100 Concepts. Guys, 100 Concepts is doing a lot of cool stuff. They just released even more products out onto their site. And I think the key here with them is they're releasing things that we need. Not it's going to be flashy, not that's going to draw a whole bunch of eyes, even though, honestly, their light caps and their scope caps did. For something so simple and something so non-complicated, non-flashy, it took social media by storm last year when they dropped those. Head on over to 100concepts.com, grab some scope caps, grab some light caps. They even have the ocular caps, which is the the partner to the scope cap that covers your eyepiece. They're going to have those back in stock. They're always working on keeping these items back in stock because they're in constant demand. Once you get one, you fall in love with it. Got to get one for every one of your rifle lights. Got to get one for every one of your scopes. They also now have chem light kits and refill tabs for those chem light kits so if you lose the pull tab on a spent chem light just order some more throw them on you're good to go and they also stock the mil spec chem lights too so it's a one-stop shop for all that good stuff again 100concepts.com guys their motto is do good be dangerous live free head on over to the site and grab yourself some gear thank you as well to our friends over at larp labs guys if you're painting a rifle you may not want to paint your optic. Just saying, if you're not a detail-oriented person, it may end poorly for you with the optic, with the flashlight, with the laser. And if you have one of these, you know, kind of niche, bougie brand optics, their warranty may not cover things like paint. That's where LARP Labs comes in. They provide durable 3M computer-cut vinyl adhesives. So whatever pattern, whatever colors you're painting your rifle, now you have these vinyl wraps that you can easily apply, remove, reapply, right, to your optics, your handheld lights, 
your PVS-14, your laser. You don't have to spray them down with spray paint. You don't have to risk it if you're uncomfortable with it. And if you live someplace like Michigan where the seasons change every other freaking day, you can change your vinyl wrap with the seasons, with the camouflage that you need. Head on over to LARPLabs.com. Hooked you guys up. Prepared Mindset, one word, is the discount code for 10% off your order. Go check it out. Pick some up for yourself. You guys are really going to dig them. Last, but definitely not least, is ActiveCarryTech.com. Guys, Active Carry is stocking American-made medical components. Things that you guys need on your kit, on your person, to be effective out in the world every day. Like I said, if you're looking for components, pieces, maybe just a tourniquet, head on over to Active Carry Tech, no H, T-E-C. Head on over to ActiveCarryTech.com, use discount code PMP10 to save yourself 10% off whenever you go to order one of their Blazer IFAC kits, one of their Gamma kits. Maybe you're looking at a Dangler, they have the Breacher kit so it fits on nicely with your plate carrier an ankle kit because you're out and about all day long in and out of structures and buildings. You want something slim and concealable, check out their guardian ankle kit. And if you still can't find what you're looking for, they have a really, really cool custom kit builder tool. Active Carry Tech is doing a lot of great stuff out there to make sure that you all are as prepared as possible. Again, activecarrytech.com, code PMP10 for 10% off. All right. So let's Let's cut it up a little bit here, folks. Let's uh, get into it. Settle in, if you will, and have a discussion around the first steps when you're getting into this, all of this, preparedness, uh, training, survivalism. Uh, There's a lot of words that you can probably throw around that fit this discussion topic, right? The, I feel like the first thing everybody goes to is your first, your first firearm, it's a natural, natural thought, right? So maybe that's a natural starting point with this discussion is buying your first firearm. Now, I didn't do it this way. Let me disclose that. I did not do it this way, and I have regrets. I wasted some money, and I'm going to bet. I'm going to help you all. I'm going to hopefully allow you all to benefit from my, I don't want to say failings, but, you know, I definitely wasted money, uh, and I would do things a little bit differently today if I knew a little bit better. So, your first, the first thing is usually your first firearm. The question I ask people when they say, oh, I'm looking into getting a gun, is a pretty common question, is what, what's it going to be used for? And usually, I get answers like, well, primarily home defense. Like, okay, that's, <clears throat> that's totally normal, totally natural. But the the operative word there is not home or defense. It's primarily. What else? What else are you trying to do with that weapon? This is where people start to kind of fall down a little bit. And it's because you buy the handgun and then you realize, oh, I'd really like something that I can run on a duty belt and go run and gun on the range with my friends and things. And, you know... The problem is a lot of guys, they go grab a SIG P365 or a Glock 43X or a Glock 48, Glock 43, Springfield Hellcat, all, all real good options out there on the market for subcompact concealed carry guns. I personally carry a 43X. Do I want to run a 43X on a duty belt out at the range? No, I do not. Um, primarily because if I'm rocking a duty belt, I need something full size. I need something big and beefy that I want. I can run with, I can gun with, I can, you know, uh, my, my considerations for concealed carry are to some degree comfort and concealability while balanced out with things like caliber round count and capacity, right? Can I put an optic on it? Things like that. If you're talking about a firearm that you're going to put on a duty belt, it's a little bit different because concealability is less of a concern. <clears throat> so something like a full-size handgun starts to make a whole hell of a lot more sense. Now, in that same breath, a lot of people don't typically have the money to buy multiple firearms at once. You probably don't have a thousand to twelve hundred, fifteen hundred dollars, right, to go out and drop and buy. Uh, I don't know a Glock 43X and a Glock 17 or a Glock 34, right? So you have to make a good decision. You know, is it really only going to be for home defense? Is it really only going to be for concealed carry? Uh, Is it going to be for both? 
And if the answer is both, then I think your answer is the Glock 19. Or the Smith & Wesson MMP Compact 2.0. Or the SIG P320, because the way SIG has their chassis design, you can swap out grip modules, you can make it a full size or a compact or something a little bit closer to a subcompact even. But understanding that, that is a big, big part of the first step. I think it's where I think it's where a lot of people stumble, is they don't look at it that way. They don't think that far ahead. They just see whatever gun <clears throat> they're being told to buy in whatever YouTube video they find. And a lot of us jump straight to, oh, well, you're, you'll be fine because the first video you found was T-Rex Arms or Grand Thumb. And, I mean, honestly, it's usually not. <laughs> it is usually not. I'll tell you, when I first got into this, you know who I watched a ton of videos from? was Hickok 45 and I watched for a whole week until you know because my brother bought his gun at a uh, flea market that was open only open on the weekends you know registered dealer everything was legit you know guy was actually who we took our CPL class from but because that's where he went that's where I decided I had to then go to instead of going to a retail establishment so I watched a whole bunch of Hickok 45 my rack veteran 8888 and those are fine However, they talk about a lot of different firearms, and, you know, honestly, eight years ago, when I started, eight, nine years ago, when I was looking into getting my first firearm, maybe even, I'm trying to think now, ten years ago, possibly even, um, no, nah, probably closer to nine. At any rate, I didn't know what I was looking for, so I wound up buying an M&P Shield, which I've talked about before on this podcast, I kind of regretted. I would look, honestly, at if it's a concealed carry gun and you are planning down the road to getting a larger size firearm, then that's okay. But if you're looking for something that does it all, I would really stick to that like Glock 19 15 round double stack size because it does both things pretty well. I don't think it does either thing particularly great. And there's a lot of people that would disagree with me on that. The guys that concealed carry a Glock 19 appendix and say that it's great and awesome. Um, I would disagree a little bit. Um, now I haven't spent a ton of time trying to carry my 19 in an appendix position, but I've spent a little bit of time and I've carried a 43 X a ton. And we'll say that I much prefer the 43 X and it has the same capacity. It's slightly harder to shoot given the shorter barrel, but then you could also go with a 48 and be completely fine. <clears throat> so that's your first step, figuring out what your first firearm is is going to be and look at a number of factors right if you're if you're stepping into a group of friends that shoot and they all run mnps maybe it makes sense for you to get mnp that way in a realistic situation if you had to depend on each other then you guys can all share magazines you can all share spare parts in my particular circle of friends we all run glocks uh, a couple of us run some 19s. Uh, one guy just picked up the new 47 and i think someone else has a uh, they just got a glock 34 so Glock 17 mags will work all the way around. So, you know, as a Glock person, then you know, buy Glock 17 mags. They're a little bit long on the 19s, but they fit the full size. Um, so then you have some versatility there in sharing resources. Okay. Now, if your first gun is going to be something else, right, it's not going to be a handgun or you already own a handgun for some reason. And now you're looking, okay, I need to get into a rifle. Okay. Here's a question I get pretty frequently from people who really just don't know what they don't know. And that's what's the best brand of AK I should get into. I don't know. I'm not an AK guy. There are, but you, I mean, Brandon Herrera is out there. He could probably tell you, I mean, I don't know. Um, now I'm sure a lot of people listening to this will talk about the virtues of the AK platform. They will talk about the effectiveness of the seven, six, two cartridge which the world over has killed a ton of people. You, you can't really dispute that fact. However, here in the continental U.S., where I'm sure most of you listening are located, we run the AR platform. Our military runs the AR platform. Most of our civilians run an AR platform. I am going to suggest that you don't look at an AK and you instead look at an AR. Why? Well, here's why. Ammo is going to be a lot easier to find, especially with everything going on in the world and this uh, 
uh, embargo, I think we have or whatever with all uh, Russian goods means it is a lot harder to find 762. And when you do find it, it is more expensive because we don't get that cheap shit that's imported anymore that AK guys love to burn through. It ain't there anymore. All that surplus that was on the shelves is pretty much gone and, and bought up. Unless you happen to find some kind of like weird shipping container just full of fucking ammo. So, ammo is the first thing. Training is a part of this discussion, so that should be a consideration. Now, I'm not saying that you should go out and buy a 22 because it's the cheapest, most readily available ammo. But I am saying that 5.56 is cheaper than 7.62. Additionally, if everybody around you runs an AR, they'll have things like spare parts and magazines. Okay? And if you guys remember a couple years ago when everybody lost their freaking minds, you I, I walked into a sportsman's warehouse, I went to a Dunham's, I went to a Cabela's, you couldn't find AR magazines. Like, I shit you not, you could find like Ruger Mini 14 mags, which are not the same, they won't work, um, but you couldn't, eat Magpul P mags, which used to be like overflowing off of store shelves, couldn't find them. But people have a ton of them. Okay, like there's people, I mean, it's not unrealistic to have over 30 magazines for an AR platform rifle. Oh, well, why so many? Well, I mean, when you start looking at a single person's loadout being five, six, seven, eight magazines, and you're outfitting two people, then it's at least 16 mags, and then you want to have some spares. Why do you want to have spares? Because stuff fails. Followers fail, springs fail, mags fall apart, you drop them and they shatter. I mean, stuff happens, right? So the availability of ammo, of ammo and magazines is huge. Additionally, it is, like I said, it's the accepted platform here in the United States. So, you know, um, it's what law enforcement, it's what military uses, it's what the good guys use. Any movie, like we've, and I, I hate the media for this, like, uh, I guess this oversensitivity we have, but, uh, you know, the, in, in movies and television shows and things, what do the bad guys always run? AKs. Does that mean that every guy with an AK is out to do evil? No, it doesn't. But it does make a pretty powerful point that, you know, when we as civilians, you think about your neighbor who knows nothing about guns, see somebody walking around with an AK, the first thought is that's a bad guy. Look at the movie SWAT, right? With Samuel L. Jackson and Colin Farrell. And a very young Jeremy Renner too. Uh, it, they, they do a lot of shit in there that's not great. You know, it's probably actually period appropriate with a lot of the gear and the guns and stuff. But you look at the imitation of the North Hollywood shootout that they opened that movie with. And what are the bad guys running? That's right. Drum fed AK platform rifles. Head to toe in camouflage and giant Kevlar vests and ski masks. So a big part of this also is you got to think, you know, end goal. Do you want to be seen and recognized as somewhat of a professional? I'm not talking about like you know, professional gunfighter or a wannabe cop or anything like that. I'm just saying that in the event that you have to deploy these skills and these tools, do you want to be seen as a good guy, as a professional? Or do you want to be one of these idiots that people see online that just, you know, ammo dump into a pile of garbage and people don't trust to own a firearm? Something to consider. Now, when you're getting into your first AR, things you should really look at, you know, brand name is not as big a deal as it used to be. I'll be very, you know, uh, clear on my opinion there. Brand name is not as big a deal as it used to be. For a while there, everybody had to have BCM. And Bravo Company makes a damn good rifle. They do. There was a period there where they had some quality control issues because they were just growing faster than they could keep up with. It happens in the business space. Understand that there's still a lot of other quality manufacturers out there. Lately, probably from support by some pretty prominent uh, social media voices, Aero Precision is another company that's also really, really coming up in the community. So for a while, there was all BCM. Then there was the the well-promoted idea, especially from uh, Lucas over at T-Rex, of get a BCM upper with an Aero lower, and that's like your go-to, like solid as, as hell budget build, which is still great. If you can afford the, if you can afford it, that's like $1,200 to get you started. Um, are there cheaper ways to do it? Yeah, you, you could go cheaper. Um, you know, I've had, I, I personally have had good luck with Palmetto State Armory. Now, a lot of guys cringe when you say that. Uh, and that's just for the same reasons that people had cringed about BCM for a little bit. There was quality control. Now, 
when and and Lucas again from T Rex did a great little bit online about this where you look at pricing and we always compare side to side, right? Well, it's made out of this steel and it's got you know this barrel twist and this feature and this and this and you know whatever. But what this one's you know five hundred bucks and this one's nine hundred bucks. So I'm I mean if they're exactly the same, I'm gonna get the five hundred dollar one. And if that were true, if they were identical side to side, then that would be the right decision. But the question is, <clears throat> why is it $400 cheaper? There's a couple factors. The biggest one usually is they cut costs in their quality control. And I'm not speaking of any companies in particular when I say this. I'm just saying that you will find some brands that you've never heard of before and likely would never hear of again, and they're super, super cheap. And that may not be what you want to jump at. Oh, yeah, but this way I can have a full rifle build sooner. Well, yeah, but if that blows up in your hand, you're going to have bigger problems than having a full rifle build or not. So something to think about, you know, um, or you could buy an arrow lower with a palmetto upper, whatever. I mean, you could, you can do whatever you want to do. Um, I would, I would caution you rather than try and build something, you know, hey, I'm going to buy this upper from here and this lower from here and try and slap it together as cheap as possible. If that's your your option because of budget, I would encourage you to look at some off the shelf offerings. Something like a Smith and Wesson M and P Sport Two. That was my first AR. I bought it after the Orlando nightclub shooting, and it has gone undergone a lot of iterations. Um, front sight post got cut off, got a low profile gas block, bolt carrier, and charging handle all got you know swapped out and everything. Um, but it has served me well. I haven't had any issues with it. I know Ruger makes an off-the-shelf AR, which is okay. Um, not my personal preference. I don't like Ruger in general, but that's just my personal preference off a couple of experiences and off of some articles and, and feedback and input that I've gotten from other folks. Um, the Springfield Saint is another AR platform rifle. It's a little bit more on the pricier side of off-the-shelf offerings, but it does come with a lot of benefits. You know, you already have a M-Lock rail, which is the straight slots. They go down the rail. Um, <clears throat> the key mod is one that looks like little little dicks all the way down the rail. And key mod is kind of going the way of the dinosaur. m got adopted by the military. So most accessories and companies that are starting out creating accessories are going m -lock. If you're buying your first rifle, I encourage you to go m -lock. Or you can get a quad rail, which has like the cheese grater looking pick rails, Picatinny rails, or 1913 Picatinny rails on all four sides. Okay, pick rails and or quad rails in general are going to be heavier, but that do, they're going to be more rigid. They're going to be more sturdy. That's another important point is when you're looking at handguards, again, this is something I've seen people do. I have witnessed people do. I have advised people against doing. Do not go and buy the cheapest handguard out there. Do not go and buy one of these anodized colored pieces of shit handguards. And here's why. What do you attach to your handguard? your grip, your white light, potentially a laser, and iron sights, or backup iron sights, or if you're doing it really wrong, your actual red dot sight. So having a cheaper handguard means that it, yeah, it may flex if it's a little bit thinner. That is the downside of like the m -lock stuff is a lot lighter, but it does flex and give a, a little bit, not where it's bending, but you might get a little a little flex there, um, which might be good for durability reasons. I, I mean, I don't know. I'm not an engineer. But with the cheap handguards, they don't flex. They just bend or they crack. And if it bends and it bends at the wrong spot, actually really any spot, A, that, that compromises the structural integrity and it could shift the zero on your sighting system which is a big problem. Here in the continental US, we have to be accountable for every round we put down range. Do not go cheap on your handguard. Additionally, what do cheap handguards come with? Cheap barrel nuts, okay? And if you don't know how a barrel and an upper are assembled, you take the barrel, you stick it in the upper, and then <clears throat> your barrel nut slides down the barrel until it meets the upper and screws down, and you torque that down with a torque wrench, okay? Cheap barrel nuts are not going to be in spec. They're not going to be made out of the better materials. So if you are running a lot of ammo or doing something stupid as hell, like mag dumping into a pile of trash, it's going to heat up. Now, if it is cheap enough, and there's definitely a lot of records and accounts is happening, when that barrel nut heats up, it could warp. 
which means that your barrel will no longer be straight and true coming out of the upper, which means you're going to first and foremost have accuracy issues and B, possibly even safety issues, because if it's not a straight channel coming out of that upper, that round is going to impact the barrel and it's going to exit somewhere, possibly into your hand, depending. Um, so for safety reasons, you know, as well as obviously just fucking common sense, please do not go buy the cheap, no name hand guards and barrel nuts that looks just like your favorite Geisley rail that looks like your favorite Midwest industries rail, save your money and get the one that you want. Go support those companies. Those companies are in a lot of cases, manufacturing here in America, which is why the price is higher, they have better quality control and it's going to serve you better over the long term. This is a tool, right, that we are talking about building and assembling to save your life, defend your life, defend your family's life. Okay. Now, in that same conversation, if you're talking about building a rifle and you get into the barrel length conversation, I know a lot of guys for a while were, were all about the 10.5 because that's the Mark 18, right? Mark 18, super sexy. Love it. It's what made me want to get a shorter barrel in the first place. Um, but now that we know a little bit more and we know about effectiveness of rounds, um, I run an 11 and a half. And I know the guys over at Core Vision and uh, Adrian over at Sidewinder Concepts both recommend the 12 and a half inch barrel. If you are looking to build one rifle, one setup that does everything okay. It's going to give you enough reach to be effective. It's going to be small enough to fit through doorways at close ranges and things like that. And you can still throw a suppressor on the end of it at some point. And it's not going to really extend you past that 16 inch overall length that you get with a lot of off the shelf ARs. So that's something else to think about now, keeping in mind that, uh, and this is up in the air as of the time of this recording, because the ATF passed a opinion about pistol braces, but anything under 26 inches overall length is a, uh, SBR. If you put a brace or sorry, if you put a stock on it and I think it's an AOW, any other weapon, uh, otherwise or something. Uh, so there's, there's some implications there. Just be aware of that and consult with, uh, your friends or, you know, if you buy it off the shelf, it's going to be fine because your big box stores have to already be pre-compliant. So if it's a pre-assembled rifle or pre-assembled AR pistol, you probably don't have too much to worry about. So don't cheap out, um, you know, things like your, your hand guard, um, your barrel, obviously you want to get something that's a reputable brand. If you don't know what reputable brands are, reach out to people. You know, you could always reach out and talk to us here. There's lots of people with even more knowledge than me. Um, you know, Ripcord Industries is a great resource. Steve over there, uh, Derek at Drop6 uh, answers that stuff in his Instagram stories all the time. And, and the list goes on, right, of guys that can give you good information. Josh Lowry, right? Uh, he's another one that's out there always answering those kinds of questions. Now, when you're looking at your first rifle build, something else you have to think about realistically, and it's a lot of people want to talk about the white light is the first thing that you should add when you get a rifle. And it's a really good point. However, I would say <clears throat> that no rifle is effective without a sling. And am I going to say that that's more effective than a white light? Uh, you know, I would say they're probably in the same level of importance. And here's why. Your sling to your rifle is what your holster is to your handgun. So much of what you learn in class, in rifle classes and, and do from an administrative standpoint is dependent upon having a sling for your rifle. And they're big, they're heavy. If it's a 16-inch or an 18-inch barrel, it's a lot nicer to be able to just hang that off your body and not have to literally hold it up all the time. So when you're looking at that rifle and you're looking at that handguard, one of the things you should look at is does it have... QD points, little QD, little circular sockets built into the, the handguard that you can connect a QD socket to that attaches to your sling. Additionally, does the stock on the lower that you're buying or the brace that you're, you're getting, or maybe the rear plate on the back of the lower receiver, did those have a QD socket for you to also plug into? Now, that, it's something to consider. If your handguard doesn't and the cheaper ones won't, and that includes handguards that come on rifles that are on the cheaper end of things, you can always buy some of these M-Lock and Picatinny uh, QD uh, sockets that you can, you can attach. But understand, you need to get a good one. Okay? 
So probably something like Magpul or from some other reputable, you know, company. And the same thing with the actually QD attachment for your sling and your sling itself. I cannot stress the importance of not, don't just, don't just get on Amazon and buy, it's what I could afford, man. Don't do that shit. Not with a sling, all right? I have had QD attachments fail on me where it just pulls straight out of the socket because either the uh, the QD piece itself is bad, which it was in this case. I've seen them where uh, the QD socket itself is out of spec on a crappy handguard and it, you know, it's a Magpul, uh, you know, QD piece and the socket just won't take it. Works fine on the BCM rail, won't work on the cheap one that you got online. If that were to come apart when you're in a life you know, threatening situation and your rifle just falls off your back because it failed on the spot. That's a problem. Same thing with a cheap sling. Do, don't, don't go get, this is what I did. I went and bought something off the shelf at, it was a field and stream at the time. Cause I didn't know any better. It was like 25 bucks. It was the end plate and a one point sling. And, uh, I thought that was just, <laughs> man. I thought that was like the high, the high speed shit, man. I thought it was so cool. Cause I finally had a sling for it. Um, had a buddy show me how to, you know, uh, take off the, <clears throat> the, the nut and everything and, and swap out the rear end plate. I thought it was so cool with that single point sling and single point slings have a place, which is why you still see them today in the market. Um, but you also don't see many like startup companies that are out there like flatline fiber co like drop six, like T-Rex arms, like Edgar Sherman, that's offered over at uh, MidwestGunWorks.com, they're not really focusing on building a single point sling. It's a concept that kind of died at the beginning of the global war on terror, and we started to realize that it's not that great for full size rifles. It gives you a lot of maneuverability, yes, but as soon as you have to stow that rifle behind you to work on, you know, a, a downed buddy, pick something up. Uh, hostage work, uh, you know, detain somebody, it, it's not going to stay back there. It's going to flop around. It's going to hit you in the dick. There's going to be all kinds of problems with it. So while you can find them on store shelves because they're like the most FUD thing in the history of, you know, ARs, um, and you can find them from, you know, cheap ass brands like, you know, I can't can even tell Caldwell, I think is the one I got. They're good for very, very short barreled sub guns. So if you have like an eight inch 300 blackout or a nine millimeter sub gun, like an MP five. Yeah. Those are good because they're too small for you to put a two point sling on realistically, but past that, they really don't have a ton of value and you need to get a good two point sling an adjustable two point sling, something that you can tighten down to your body to keep the gun out of the way. Or if you stow it onto your back while you're again, helping a buddy rendering medical, uh, whatever, whatever the case may be, you want something you can tighten down. So it's not swinging all over the place and, you know, hitting you in the head or the dick, or, you know, if you go to bend down to help somebody give them medical aid and it swings around and hits them in the face, that's also a pretty big problem. And there are stories of that shit happening out there because people have cheap, shitty slings. Don't get something with bungee retention built in. That bungee retention shit doesn't fucking matter. It really doesn't. I have never once been in a situation, I mean, for whatever this is worth, whether it's class or on the range training or dry practice training, where I've, you know, oh, I just need a little bit more give. I need a little bit more flex. Man, I really wish this had bungee in it. I've never, ever, ever had that happen to me. And most of the guys that I run with and have shot with, they don't run that shit either because you don't fucking need it. It's just one more thing that can go wrong. You know, if you're stitching together multiple types of material, which means nylon to elastic, that's a failure point. If those stitches rip and that comes apart, then that sling, that A, that elastic retention, once it separates, you don't get that elastic anymore because it's not connected. It's just the nylon on the outside, that nylon covering. So when it fails, and it's not if, it's it's when, it, it'll be completely useless and it'll be a wasted $20. Go buy a decent sling. Preferably, do yourself a favor, get one with a pad on it. <clears throat> Otherwise, the back of your neck is going to be all kinds of fucked up. Uh, you know, Blue Force Gear makes padded slings. Uh, Feral Concept Slingster is what I run on a lot of mine. Uh, there's a lot of options out there. If you don't want to go padded, there's even more options out there. But, you know, you can get one of the Magpul ones even. Just get, buy a quality sling. If that means that you can't get it through Amazon and you have to wait a little bit, that's okay. Order it from a reputable company that's making goods here in the U.S. and get a good one. 
I've had slings that are lasting me now upwards of five years. Now, granted, not very heavy use because I'm a civilian, but no problems at all. Not a single one has torn. It has not failed. I've not had any you know issues with the hardware. Nothing. Okay. Moving on from that, yes, we can talk about white light, <clears throat> and there's a lot of options out there on the market. If you are at the entry level and you don't have a ton of money, I would really recommend looking at Streamlight. They're they're you know uh, the ProTac series that they have is pretty much the generally accepted best entry level white light, and it comes with a, a clicky uh, cap, like an end cap pressure button, um, and then it also has a pressure pad that can connect onto your Picatinny rail. They offer it in like three versions right now. And I think they just had their 2.0 line come out. That's going to be even better for some things. Um, and they run, you know, the small ones about 300 lumens, which isn't great. And then you go up to the regular, the, the full size pro tech is about like 450 lumens. And then if you get the HLX, which is for a lot of people, it's the only one they recommend. It's like a thousand lumens of output. Um, and they all come with the same hardware. They come with a clamp on uh, piece that's built onto the light that you can attach to a Picatinny rail, um, which can also be removed. So if you buy things like a light bar or something like that from a company like T-Rex or Arasaka, um, one of those other companies out there, it can attach to that using the Scout footprint that's popular with the Surefire lights. Um, so any of those Streamlight lights is a really, really good option. Um, I've not had any of them fail on me. I know some people have said that they have and that they don't like their pressure pads, so they use the tail cap. Um, you know, experiences vary with every product. Just keep that in mind. Um, do not, though, if you're on a budget, do not, do not, do not buy an O-Light. Olight is a company that I think is trying to get things right, but they have just had some terrible, terrible, terrible offerings brought to market, uh, and they're dangerous. There's m- dozens and dozens of stories you can find out there, if not hundreds, of people's Olights overheating and basically blowing up. Um, they're very high-powered lights. A lot of people in the EDC community really like like the the Olight baton. You know, for the the small size and the small package, they love the output. And then Olight moved into pistol lights and rifle lights, and that's great. Um, but they do pay people for their opinions on YouTube. That's a like pretty well documented issue, um, and they're they're not safe to be around for the output and the price. Like, just get a Streamlight, and then upgrade later. Um, they really don't have a whole lot of additional benefit that is worth you know gambling on in terms of your safety. Um, and if that blows up, then you're just at worst or at best case, you're just without a white light at worst case, you're in a world of fucking hurt. Um, another company you could look at too, from the budget side is night stick and I T E stick. Um, they look a lot like the Streamlight lights, uh, a little bit different company on the budget. end. Uh, I've heard good things about them, not too many bad things, but I don't know how many people are out there actually running those guys. Um, I know hollow sun is getting into pistol lights now too. So if you're looking for a duty pistol light, um, that's something else to consider is what Hollow Sun's offering. Streamlight's TLR1 is, I think, still the generally accepted budget uh, pistol light or the TLR1 HL. Streamlight is, as I recommend that to everybody. Um, you know, if you have more money, if you're budgeting, or if you are planning down the line, hey, I'm not going to go budget. I'm going to get a decent one, just not right now. Um, it does open up to a lot more options. Surefire is a good brand of light. They've been around for a long time. They have a ton of military contracts, um, which is part of the reason why they're more expensive is the military contract component. So they, whatever they sell it to the military for, they cannot sell it to you for cheaper than that. So you can get Surefire. Um, it's about double the price. You're looking around, around $300 for most Surefire offerings, maybe a little bit more. Um, if you got like a vampire light that, that does both visible light and IR, um, they have the new turbo ones too, that are like super, super high candela. Um, but very reliable. You know, a lot of guys swear by the surefire stuff. It costs more money, but you know, you probably get your money's worth. Um, something else to point out if we're talking about handgun lights, like I like the X 300, make sure you're buying a holster that's light compatible. If that's your plan, uh, Safari Land. Uh, that's what I was trying to think of. Safari Land holsters are pretty much the gold standard for duty holsters because they have level two and possibly level three retention where you have to defeat 
with your thumb a uh, little lever <clears throat> and uh, you know retains the weapon, it's not going to fall out. Um, there are other options out there. You can go with Kydex, like a T Rex Arms Ragnarok. Just understand the only thing keeping that that keeping that handgun in the holster is the amount of friction retention um, around either the trigger guard or if there's a weapon light, it's around the weapon light. So um, I have seen it happen in class where somebody's gun went flying out of their holster um, because and it wasn't a T Rex to be clear. It was a different brand. Um, gun went flying out of the holster and slid down the range and the instructor had to go down the end of the range and go pick it up off the floor and bring it back. Um, and that wasn't even, that wasn't like user error, operator error. That was just, you know, Hey, uh, that's not a good holster for that. Um, and it has its down downfalls and drawbacks. Um, a lot of people swear by Kydex, uh, personally, if it's a duty holster outside the waistband, I'm going, I'm going Safari land until I have a, a bad experience with them. I know a lot of people are rocking the alien gear stuff. Now alien gears outside the waistband holster, or their duty holster. I don't even know what it's called. Um, is actually, it looks pretty robust. And a lot of people kind of like it. And a lot of these too, they, they allow for lights, but they will work without a light. So you can still run it, you know, like the seven TS series from Safari land, you can still run it without a light on it until you get your light. And they also allow for optics. You know, um, and that's an important distinction too. When you're buying a handgun, is uh, make sure it's optics ready. Whether that means uh, that it comes with an optic, because a lot of the Sig P320s out there now come with the Sig Romeo optic on it, or it has removable optics mounting plate, like the Glock MOS series, or I think the M&P line is doing that now too, where you can add whatever optic you want after the fact. But um, getting back to the rifle, right? So have a good white light. It's paramount that you can see what you're shooting. You have to have positive identification. Again, we've said it on, in this discussion and we've said it in other in other episodes and things too, is you have to be able to identify what you're shooting at. You are responsible and accountable for every round you put down range. You have to be. Now, from there, the furniture is up to you. You know, really, uh, if we're talking about your first time and you're you're not going all crazy, the mil spec furniture that it comes with, you know, uh, is fine. Uh, you can also, for fairly cheap money, uh, upgrade your your pistol grip to something like a Magpul. I really like the BCM Mod Three. I really like that one. Um, I also like the Tango Down grip. Uh, that one's not bad at all either. Um, stocks, Magpul, BCM. Uh, there's a lot of stocks being offered out there now. I would really stick to those two companies. I've used both of those or, or B5 systems. I've also used, um, and had really, really positive experiences with those. Um, they include a QD socket built into most of them. So if you are looking, if you're the, the lower you bought doesn't have a QD socket on the rear plate, buy one of those stocks that does that way you can run from either front of your receiver to the, uh, stock, the opposite side of the stock that you're on. Um, or from, if you want to go, you know, the bow and arrow style, you want to go from as far forward on the handguard as you can <clears throat> to the stock, you have that that option. You can run it QD. Um, if you're talking about internals, we're not going to talk about it here. Really, mil spec for your first rifle, unless you've ran your buddy's rifle a whole bunch, you don't need super light triggers. You don't need, you know, ambi controls and ambi safeties or 45 degree safeties. Are they nice to have? Yeah. Yeah, they're great to have. Things like Magpul bad levers, they're great to have. But unless you've been training with them, they usually are more headache than they're worth with light triggers, uh, especially cheap ones. Cheap lightweight drop-in triggers or cheap competition triggers, uh, you know, if a spring like that breaks or something, your gun is down. It's not something you're easily swapping out. So make sure you buy name brand, get like a Geisley or something like that. I know there's other brands out there. I don't know because I just run mil spec triggers. I am not a good enough shooter to outrun that trigger yet. <clears throat> so I just run mil spec and that's my recommendation. Keep your lower mil spec, man. You don't need all the extra shit. Go learn how to shoot and then upgrade later down the line and you can have a gunsmith do it for you the right way. Or if you've learned how to do it yourself, you can do it. Um, I would say the last piece I want to talk about with your first rifle would be obviously, uh, your optic, you know, in the conversation of what's budget friendly, I think hollow sun and vortex are kind of King these days. Um, what I caution everybody against is do not 
do not go on Amazon and find something that looks just like a hollow sun or looks just like an aim point or looks just like, you know, an EOTech. And because they're not going to hold up and perform. They may still run, but they're not going to hold zero. And they're sure as shit not going to be reliable. Okay. And reliability goes a lot further than, than saying, oh, it stays on cheap QD mounts can break that optic could go flying off your gun. And then, you know, if it was even still sighted incorrectly or still zeroed, then you're out of luck. Cause now you have no sighting apparatus. And if you want the cheap handguard and your irons aren't reliable, cause it twisted or bent or something, then you have no way to aim that gun. So, um, if you're talking about from a budget perspective, like I like the vortex crossfire two red dot, I don't know if that one is even still in production. I hope it is because I think I paid $150 when I got mine and that thing still runs. I think I've changed the batteries like twice. Just absolutely outstanding. It doesn't have an auto on feature, but it's a budget optic. The shake awake is you get that in some of the hollow suns. Um, so maybe that's something else to consider too. I don't know all of the hollow sun naming conventions. There's so many, it's ridiculous. Uh, what I, will say you should probably avoid if you are you know if you're really being budget friendly don't go buy a cheap magnified optic um you know some of these companies out there making these one to sixes one to eights even one to ten scopes and somehow are doing this for under two hundred dollars uh it's uh, i question the performance capability of those optics and not saying that they couldn't make one that worked fine um but i do really question it you know uh the vortex strike eagle is an okay lpvo for around 250 bucks and around the holidays you can find it for 250 and it includes the the mount which is kind of a steal in my opinion because it's a pretty good mount um but generally speaking with glass like magnified optic glass you know lpvos you're gonna get what you pay for so understand that yes your vortex strike eagle one to six or one to eight may be okay for you it is not gonna hold up against even a vortex viper pst which is like a five or six hundred dollar one to six and it's definitely not going to hold its own when you compare it to something like the leopold mark five uh stuff from collis or schmidt and bender or even the vortex razor one to six razor one to ten um it's just not as nice now i know there's some people that love it out there because it's budget and they they just like the reticle and they do well with it and that's fine um, but understand that when you're talking about spending $400 on a red dot, you're getting a pretty decent red dot, um, or $700 on an EOTech, you're getting a pretty good optic spending $700 on an LPVO. You're not really getting that great of an optic. Uh, the good optics are several thousands of dollars for good glass. <clears throat> um, I know some, I know people have spent upwards of $2,500 on a scope. And that still is not on the, like, most premium end of things. It's a nicer scope, certainly, on the higher end of, uh, you know, most brands, but not, not like, the nicest thing that's out there at market. So uh, I'd be wary of what kind of optics you're buying and where you're putting your money in that regard because you want to have something that's going to last. And, you know, additionally, companies like Leopold, companies like Vortex, uh, you know, Holosun, I think, uh, most of these good companies... Uh, will, you know, have a lifetime warranty attached. Companies like Lead and Steel that we've had on this podcast before. That's another one you can look at if you have 300 to $400 for a good red dot that's robust and is going to be durable as shit is their Promethean. And they're also coming out with a pistol optic too called the Pandora. Three to 400 bucks. Go check that out. Grab one of those. Um, if you have less than $300 though, I would not look at a magnified optic. And for the purposes of this conversation, you don't even need an offset optic, you know, offset 45s, piggyback 45s. It is nice to have, but it's an LPVO. It goes one to six. Is the one magnification going to be perfect? No, but it will be functional. And I would train with that before investing, you know, a hundred dollars in an Arasaka or a T-Rex arms offset mount. And then another couple hundred dollars or less, you know, in a cheap, shitty, uh, RMR clone or Aimpoint T2 clone or something like that. That's just extra money spent. I would say, you know, again, in the scope of this conversation, you really don't need it to be effective. Um, so if that's, you know, talking about a rifle, that's really it. You know, um, handguns, again, we talked about optics and things like that. Don't go cheap on your optics, pistol optics, especially because of the reciprocating slide. 
uh, I would stick very specifically to like Trigicon, Leopold, uh, the Aimpoint Acro is a good one, or any of the Hollow Sun pistol optics are pretty good. Um, I've had decent luck with the Vortex pistol stuff, not that I ran it a whole lot of times, but um, you know they just came out with their Defender option. The other options that are out there that are sub $200, don't do it. Just don't do it. The internals are going to fail. The connections are going to fail. It's not going to hold zero. You're really, really going to have a bad time. Um, and you're going to you're gonna be wasting money because those cheap companies don't offer warranty services. Okay? So I would say if you don't have the money for a red dot and you have a pistol that is optics ready, rock the iron sights. They all come with irons. Learn how to shoot better with irons, save up the money, and get a red dot. You'll be way happier that you did. We just had a range day a couple weeks ago. One of the guys went, the next thing he did was, like, almost the next day, was sell the, the 40 cal uh, M&P he had and went and bought an optics-ready Glock. And, yep, loves it. Uh, it has a Vortex Viper red dot on there. Um, is that the most premium of red dots? No, but did it work? Yes. Is he working on upgrading to an RMR? Also, yes. Trigicon RMR, I highly recommend. That's what I run. I know a lot of guys really dig it. Um, the enclosed optics are starting to get more popular. I know like Steiner has one out there too that I've heard some things about. Um, so just don't go super cheap. There's definitely ways to save money. You don't need to get like the Gucci Glock with all the slide cuts and all the you know the anodized barrels and compensators and stuff and all the special stippling. Like that stuff's nice, but we're talking about your first purchase. Okay, now we talked a little bit about holsters and what you should have, but if we're talking about your gear going with it, I would definitely say the first thing if you're running a handgun that you need to buy afterwards is a, a holster, but then a belt to carry it on. Don't buy, you know, I mean, you can, but I would say a belt needs to come before a chest rig and a belt needs to come before a plate carrier because if you don't have something to carry the holster on, what good is the holster and the handgun? right? And don't, you're not going to just cowboy it and shove it in the front of your jeans like Mel Gibson in Lethal Weapon. That's how you shoot your dick off. Don't fucking do that dumb shit. Get a good quality belt. And there's a ton out there on the market. T-Rex Arms uh, makes their Orion belt, and now there's Speed Belt, too. That's a two-piece, like, uh, competition style. I run an Orion. I love it. I've had nothing but just awesome, positive experiences with the Orion belt. Um, I know a lot of guys, they run the Ronin belt system. Um, that's really, really good. The Senshi, I think it's called. I know AWS makes stuff out there. There's a ton of good belt options. But again, you're not you're not going to be able to go find something like that on, for the most part anyways, you're not going to be able to go find something like that on Amazon. Don't go buy a $20 belt on Amazon or like an old surplus Gen 1 Condor belt and think that it's going to run super, super well for you. It's it's, it's not. Um, I will say the cheapest I've, I would go, it's like 70 or 80 bucks. It is, it is a Condor. Um, it's like their Gen 3 battle belt and it has Cobra buckles on it. Actually really good for the money. Um, understand that it's not the best thing that's out there, but it is the best out there for the sub hundred dollar range. I think it's like 80 bucks, uh, anything other than that and cheaper than that. I just run away, just run away. Cause you're wasting money. You're throwing money away. Um, you want something with some rigidity. It's going to, the belt's there to help support and hold up all of this weight and these other items, your magazine pouches and things. Um, buy a good belt. Realistically, you're probably going to be spending at least $150 on a belt, like a real battle belt. Uh, if you want the nicer ones, like the GBRS belt and things like that, you're you're $300 or more. The bison belt from Ferro Concepts, you're, you're getting up there, you know. Um, but those things are also really, really well made, and they're going to last. You know, I've had uh, the inner belt that I'm running for my Orion, I've had for two or three years, no problems with it. And the Orion, the outer belt, uh, I've had for over a year now, no problems. Uh, the, the original outer belt was is three years old now. I just gave it to a buddy for, you know, super cheap money. Uh, and he's going to be building that out and rocking that himself. Um, so on that belt system, uh, you know, like I said, buy quality. Uh, and also don't load it up with a bunch of bullshit. Here's what you need on your belt. <clears throat> Mag carriers. I recommend the S-Tac Kaiwi pouches. Um, I know High Speed Gear also makes some really good ones that you'll probably enjoy as well. Um, there's other companies out there. I've not tried those. 
so I can't I can't and won't recommend them because I've not used them. Uh, the Aztec Kaiwis uh, I have had since my very first battle belt, and when I was rocking a Gen One piece of shit Condor that I hated, and they've been amazing, absolutely amazing. They have the Kydex inserts for extra retention. Uh, and for like 50 bucks, they make it all in one, two pistol mags and a rifle mag pouch. And that one you actually can sometimes find on Amazon. Just make sure it's actually from STAC and not from like some weird knockoff company like Crydex or Tactical Cat or something goofy. I don't fucking know. Um, and, it, and really to start, that's all you really need. Um, if you can get a medical pouch on there, medical is always good to have. Um, but if you can't afford a decent medical pouch again you don't want it to fail how does a medical pouch fail it falls off the fucking belt um because then if it comes off and you don't realize it and you go to reach for that and tear that away to use it and you don't have it there then you're really shit out of luck um blue force gear has a micro trauma pouch it's really good uh the t-rex med one is what i have on my belt um there's a ton of good med offerings even actually I, that's what i do like from condor is a tear away like burrito style med pouch um that I ran for several years, and I love that thing because it's big enough to be effective, but small enough uh, not to really get in the way. And I've had no issues with it coming coming off when I didn't want it to. Um, so holster, belt, mag pouches, med kit. If you want, you can add a dump pouch. Dump pouches really aren't necessary. It's more of like a convenience and administrative thing, um, unless you need it for like SSE for work or something. Um, but Truly, that's all you need. You don't need to be throwing three. Fuck, you don't need three pistol mags and two rifle. If you want that, it's nice to have, but you don't need it. Uh, you don't need a fucking fixed blade knife on your belt. You can, if you are going to use it for something specific, then go ahead. But it's not something you need right away. You don't need an extra tourniquet holder unless there's not one on your medical pouch. Um, you don't need a multi-tool pouch. You don't need a flashlight pouch. You don't need a handcuff pouch. Like, that's just extra stuff. Now, if you do need it for work, then you probably already know this, and you can just ignore everything I'm fucking saying. But to get started, that's what that's where I would go with, is just magazine pouches and a med pouch, and that's it. Lighter is better. You don't want to be carrying around an extra, a bunch of extra crap that's just going to weigh you down and make you completely fucking miserable. Buy from reputable companies, and this stuff will last for the casual user like you and I. This will last several years. And the last thing I'll say about it is get it in a colorway that makes sense. You know, uh, a lot of companies have actually moved away from some of the goofy camouflages, thankfully. Um, you know, my first Orion belt was in Coyote Tan. I fucking hate Coyote Tan now. My taste has changed, you know, dramatically. Um, and I also didn't end up getting a plate carrier in Coyote Tan. I got multicam black for my first plate carrier. So, uh, not my first, but my first real one. I ended up moving everything over to Ranger Green, which ended up being a costly and, you know, kind of annoying endeavor having to swap everything over. So, really, make a good choice. Don't get M81 for everything, because M81 is only good in some environments. I personally, I recommend Ranger Green. Coyote Brown or Coyote Tan can work if that's the way you want to go. Uh, again, it's environmentally dependent or, you know, Wolf Gray. Uh, unless, you, it, it, unless you need it for work, I don't usually recommend Black. Black's usually the cheapest color because it's you know, used a lot for law enforcement and a lot in some military applications and a lot in security. Uh, but you look like a mall ninja when you're in all black tactical gear. You just you look like a mall ninja. That's my opinion. Some guys got to do it for work. Some guys like the clean aesthetic of all black. And if that's true, like you do you, man. But I would recommend against it. I would I would go with something like Wolf Gray. I would go with something like Ranger Green. Now, uh, the last bit of this, uh, I'll go over somewhat high level because, you know, everybody gets into it and has questions about it, um, but it's really not something you need to get up and running with your first steps and your first experiences is your a, a plate carrier or a chest rig. Now, <clears throat> the value here is obviously that with, a, with both a plate carrier and a chest rig, you can carry more gear. And what you're mostly concerned with is additional rifle mags. So some of these chest rigs can carry six or seven mags. If you got a TAPS system, like a surplus army TAPS chest rig, that's really cool. Um, for beginner shooters, I usually don't recommend something like that because, you know, you're, you're not, you don't need to be loaded down with all of that. You're probably just going to the flat range and, you know, a simple three mag loadout will work 
and you can get something like the Mark IV or the Mark V from Spirit of Systems. You can get the MSP from RDR Gear, which I absolutely love and recommend to everybody. Um, but buy something from that perspective of what's going to work for you. Unless you're expecting to get deployed and need to carry seven magazines all the time and have a bunch of shit hanging off of you, you don't need that when you're starting out. I would honestly save the money until you have a better idea of what you do need. But again, just don't go buy something off of Amazon that looks like, you know, the, Amazon's great for this, unfortunately, that something that looks just like the Haley Strategic Placard or Chest Rig, something that looks just like the Spiritus System Chest Rig and H Harness and everything. Support companies that are American companies that are making American made goods. And also, do, you know, do your research, figure out what you need. Um, I can tell you, as somebody who went out of his way to do this absolutely as cheap as possible, I got a Condor plate carrier as my first carrier. It did not have side cumber buns, so it really limited the adjustability. And I bought steel plates off of eBay for about a hundred bucks for the pair, um, and it was kind of awful. It was very heavy. That's like an extra. That's twenty pounds right there, or twenty up, possibly up to twenty four pounds, just in your steel armor plates. Now I run level three plates, the so same level of protection as the steel, but they're 2.8 pounds per plate. So I cut like 15 pounds off of me just by changing that. And, what, you know, oh, well, that okay, fine. That's not that big of a deal, though. I mean, it's good workout. Yeah, but then you're adding on the weight of how many loaded mags you're carrying. If you're carrying a ruck or a backpack, how much more is that? So, um, And steel is not great. You know, like good steel, if that's such a thing, yeah, that's a little bit different conversation, but understand a lot of what what is out there is not good. Um, and back face deformation, like how much of a dent is going to be left in that steel when the round impacts, that could, you know, it could crack your sternum, it could, you know, crack a rib, it could cause worse internal damage. Um, there's also spalling on that steel armor, which is like when the round impacts and it fragments and shoots pieces everywhere. Um, those pieces, it could shoot straight up through your chin into your brain cavity and kill you. Um, now, a lot of these companies advertise anti-spall coating, and that's really, in a, in a lot of instances, it's just like rhino liner from your dad's truck or your truck, whatever. Um, so I really, I really, d I don't recommend you get steel plates unless you're buying them to like work out in and only to work out in. That's, that's a different conversation. Um, but save your money and buy decent plates. West coast armor. I like, I've, I have ACE link plates. I know a lot of guys run HESCO plates, um, and get it in a carrier that's rated for it. You know, a lot of these good carriers out there, like the Pharaoh Slickster, uh, the T-Rex AC-1, they're rated for regular armor plates. They're not rated for steel because nobody fucking runs steel anymore. Even the military's moving away from it. Um, steel armor is what we had in like the 90s and early 2000s. Like Black Hawk Down, they were running small steel plate armor. Um, but it's cheap, and there's a huge market for it because it is cheap and people don't know any better. Honestly, if you're just getting into it, I would I would just say skip it. I know you want it, but unless you're out there running with your buds and hitting the range and training and everything, and you actually have need for plates, you know, get a good chest rig. It's you're never going to get rid of it. You're still going to use it when you're out doing small unit tactics training and patrol training and things like that. Um, a good chest rig will serve you better than a really crappy plate carrier, and it can be had for way less money. Um, I think for like if you were to go like the Spiritus Mark IV placard with their fat straps, I think you're still under like 150 bucks, um, maybe even, you know, less than 120 bucks. I, or I'd, I'd have to look at it, honestly. Um, you know, RDR gear sells it all as a package. You just got to buy the shoulder strap separate, but it comes with, you know, you get the MSP placard and it's like 90 bucks or hundred bucks comes with all of your inserts for your magazines and your, your Velcro flaps and stuff. Um, I know, uh, Pharaoh has, uh, options, uh, there's another uh, Cirrus, I think, is, or Cirrus Dynamics or something was uh, one of the other companies I just saw on Instagram. There's tons of options out there, but get something that's well made uh, with good, good quality Cordura here in the United States. Um, you don't need a bunch of general purpose pouches hanging off. I'm going to stuff a poncho in here and I'm going to do land nab shit and shove it in here. And I'm going to have, you know, three days worth of food and shove it in this other pocket. Like if you're if you're going out and doing that stuff, then, then yeah, do that. Um, buy some quality components there. But if we're talking again in specifically the scope of your first kit, your first loadout, 
the belt is first, and then yes, you can build. You can get a a slim plate carrier. If you are looking at a plate carrier, I would recommend something slick. Um, a lot of the offerings out there now have the ability. Oh, you know, you gotta attach back panels. Here's why back panels don't work though. Um, if you're getting into your first plate carrier, back panels only work if you're running with a team because you can't reach it. Your range of motion with your arms literally isn't there. Um, which is why a lot of guys run slick carriers like the AC one or the slickster or the LV one, one nine, even from, from spiritus, um, you know, or one of those other, you know, slick carriers out there and they put a backpack on, you can doff the backpack, dig through it, get whatever you need and don it back on. Um, it makes more sense. Back panels are good in a team setting. If someone's going to grab a banger or something out of your pouch, or they're going to grab med, or they're going to grab a litter or breaching stuff or, or, or whatever your team runs, then that's different. But again, you probably know that better than I do. If you're listening to this and have a realistic need, if you're sitting here listening, going, do I need that? The answer is no, not even probably no. The answer is no. If you don't know for sure, then you don't need it. Um, most of us don't run in team settings like that. And if we do, we don't run in, run in them often enough to train and rehearse in them to where it's an essential part of the kit. And they're also cost prohibitive. The back panel alone on a lot of these things is 180 to $200. That's more than what the Pharaoh Slickster costs, what the Pharaoh Molly Slickster costs. It's more than what the TRX Arms AC1 costs. And forgive me, I don't remember the name, but like RDR gear makes a slick plate carrier too. And it's more than that costs just for the back panel. You probably don't need it unless you, unless you do, in which case you're probably not listening to this for that, that reason. Um, if you need a back panel, you probably already know more about this than what I'm talking about here. First plate, like I I'm working with the AC one right now from T-Rex so far. I really like it. Um, I like the elastic cummerbunds on the slim plate carriers because it, you can size it a little bit. So if you're wearing bulkier clothes or something, you can tighten it down and, and let it out a little bit. If you're wearing a jacket or something, it gives you just a little bit more flexibility. Um, and when you're looking at these plate carriers and they have the elastic cummerbunds, I encourage you to look for the ones that have the cells stitched into them. So you can put things like extra mags in there or extra pistol mags, multi-tools, radios, uh, med kits, things like that. The AC one and the slickster both allow for that. Um, and they're just secured by Velcro. So you can always swap in a more rigid cummerbund like Pharaoh's got a, uh, Tigris cummerbund. It's very rigid. You can attach side armor pouches and things like that to it. Um, you could run it just as is if you like a rigid cummerbund, but I know there's also companies out there that make, you know, elastic cummerbunds that are literally just two bands of elastic and they're not stitched together for any cells. And I think that's a giant waste of real estate. Um, if you need to keep things in it, you know, like, uh, like a vacuum sealed med kit or a radio or a tourniquet or an extra pistol mag or something, just give yourself the opportunities to be successful there. Um, and that will all possibly change as you learn more and get further into things. But again, it's, I think the overwhelming, uh, point during all of this is just, is don't go cheap. Don't go to Amazon. Amazon hates the second amendment. Um, that's why you can't buy firearm parts there. Not, not really. Um, they're also, they have things like the Amazon's choice flag on a lot of like optic mounts and things that are the Chinese knockoffs of like the unity mounts, the unity risers. Oh yeah. 20 bucks, 30 bucks. There's a reason why those are 20 or 30 bucks versus the actual unity mounts that are made here in America and are not going to strip out and give you a shitload of problems that are a hundred bucks or more. Okay. Don't buy that crap off Amazon stuff. You can buy off Amazon, uh, gloves, uh, sometimes optics, as long as it's from a legit company, like a real EOTech or a real Aimpoint or a real Vortex optic. Um, you can buy Magpul hardware on there. Magpul sells on there. So if you want a Magpul sling, if you want Magpul QDs, um, you know, don't, don't go on Amazon for rifle furniture because the stuff you're going to get there is it's going to look like what you think it is, but it's not that it is knockoff shit from China that you're going to spend the exact same amount of money on maybe a buck or two less, and it's not the same, right? Don't buy rifle furniture off Amazon. You're just going to look like an idiot in front of all your friends when they 
pointed out to you and you go, oh, shit. And I really, I mean, you might be able to get Magpul, again, Magpul backup sites, but I would be very weary of buying any kind of iron sites off of Amazon because a lot of those companies that make the good iron sites and stuff, they aren't allowed to sell because on Amazon because they sell other things that they deem inappropriate, so they just pull their business off there entirely. You know, unfortunately, you're just going to have to suck it up and wait for normal shipping like the rest of us. Um, And I will say also, this is probably worth mentioning, if you're trying to get better quality gear at a lower price point, check out used sites. Um, TaxSwap is a great uh, tool if you're trying to get gently used gear or uh, gear that still has a lot of life left in it for a lower price point. Great, great resource. There's also a lot of Facebook groups that you can join that sell use. I know Spiritus Symptoms is a site that or a page on Facebook that is completely dedicated to uh, reselling Spiritus gear. Guys that bought it in a full set in one colorway. Hey, I got to switch for work. Here you go. Hey, I'm moving all my kid over to something else. Here you go. Hey, the new model or new iteration, because just like any other industry, they have new models come out. I want to get that. Here's my old setup selling it for this price. And it's usually, if not always at a lower MSRP than what you would pay for it brand new. And a lot of these guys take pretty good care of their gear as well as it's well-made. So you know, it's going to last. Um, or, you know, also if you're running in a group, there's a better than not chance that guys have gear that they bought and are no longer using because they moved on to something else. There's no shame in buying used gear. As long as it's quality gear from a reputable company, it's going to last. I mean, short, if you pick this thing up and it looks like it was wiped in shit and been through like eight deployments in Afghanistan or something, um, you can probably rest assured that it's going to be serviceable for you and for your needs. And everyone moves on. Everyone moves on to different gear, to better gear. We have advancements in gear. Your, as you experience different things, your style changes, your taste in gear changes, the things that you're looking for, they change. That's okay. But again, this conversation is around your first steps, what to buy, what to look for, what not to buy, right? And making smart decisions. And if you don't know, don't be afraid to ask. There's a lot of resources out there. Again, The whole point of me recording this conversation was because it's a question that I get all the time from people. I even had specific requests. Hey, can you do an episode about this? After I was having several conversations with the same individual about, hey, I'm buying my first rifle. What should I look for? Hey, how does this look? Hey, how does this look? What would you recommend here? All right. So just don't go cheap. Wait it out. Buy once, cry once. And, or at the very least, just be more measured with how you spend your money. Don't go for the lowest dollar, you know, because uh, it's really embarrassing when that red dot you, you, that looks like it's an aim point isn't, and you roll into class and you're the guy rocking the cheap piece of shit that goes flying off the rifle. Okay, don't do that to yourself. Set yourself up for success, even if it takes a little bit longer. All right, and if you have a certain idea of how you want your rifle to end up and what you want to build for yourself, then know that. And just like with training, understand it takes time to get there. It takes energy and commitment to get there and just commit and work toward towards it and grind it out. That's how most of us started. And that's where a lot of us still are. Not, there's not too many of us that I know of in the space, short of some very large names and things that have a lot of professional connections. There's not too many of us that can just go out and just drop hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars and thousands of dollars all at once to go from absolutely nothing to full setup overnight. You can't do it. And it's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. I know we all want it, but realize that it's not going to happen. And if you try to force it, you will more than likely make decisions that you regret or wish you had done a little bit differently. Or maybe you don't hate it, but you don't love it the way you thought you would. So hopefully this has been helpful for you guys. And if you're listening to this, you're one of the people that, that reached out and contacted me. Hopefully this does illuminate my thoughts and my feelings a bit better around you know, Hey, what should I buy? When should I get it? Um, I think we touched on almost everything really. Uh, you know, I, I would say, you know, one of the things we haven't, we didn't really get into is communications and radio. Um, it usually comes along, along a lot later and it's something that you, to be effective, you don't necessarily need that. You will be more effective. Um, it's also not something I'm tremendously good at or well-versed in. So I defer to a lot of other people like ham radio crash course for things like that. Um, as well as, you know, like Mojave repeater out on, on social media and YouTube that that has a lot of great content around radios, the communications piece, 
um, you know, down the line, you get into things like helmets and suppressors and night vision and the list goes on, right? But understand that when you get started, you don't have to be the same as everybody else. Your your bar for achievement is lower than everyone else because you're just getting started. Just like with your shooting standards. Yeah, if you've only been shooting for six months, you're not going to shoot as well as somebody who's been going six years or 16 years, right? So it happens in stages and it's a process. Be okay with it. Enjoy the ride. Honestly, one of the most exciting things, most exciting feelings is when you get a new piece of gear for the very first time. I'm not talking about, you know, oh, I bought, I had a weapon light and I bought a new one. I'm talking about when you get a weapon light for the first time, you get a sling for the first time, a plate carrier for the first time, you know, it's, it's cool. It's a learning process. And, you know, like I said, enjoy the journey. Um, that's kind of what a lot of this is about. And, you know, as you, as you move through that path, uh, you'll learn more, you'll know more and you'll have a better idea of what you want and what you don't want. And it's, it's, you'll, you'll get there eventually. So, um, I hope you guys enjoyed this. It's something that I, you know, like I said, I get a lot of questions. I've been meaning to, to talk about this and to get my, you know, get all this out there at once. Um, I know we talked about bits and pieces of these different topics, uh, at probably several different times throughout other episodes, but really wanted to have something that was very dedicated around, you know, your first steps and really getting, you know, immersed in what you're doing here with this community. So, uh, I hope you guys learned some stuff. Uh, as always, feel free to shoot us an email prepared.mindset.podcast at gmail.com. If you have questions or feedback or input, uh, you know, direct message us on Instagram. It's prepared underscore mindset underscore pod or join our Patreon. Patreon.com forward slash prepared underscore mindset underscore pod has more of this information. It has, you know, uh, specific. Uh, episodes, exclusive episodes that only our patrons get get access to, and videos on this stuff that only our patrons get access to. And you know, the the patron dues they come back and support us here and help us do more and bring more to you. So, uh, but that's all I got for this week, folks. Uh, until next time, you guys get out there, do your research, make smart decisions, and like we always say here, work hard, train smarter, and be prepared. 